My name is Asma Eskedom, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center. Our speaker today is Dr. Robert Litwack. Dr. Litwack is the Senior Vice President and Director of International Security Studies at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. He previously served on the National Security Council as Director for Nonproliferation. He's also held affiliations with several institutions, such as Georgetown, Harvard, and Oxford University, among others. He has published several uh, books and papers on North Korea, Iran, Russia, and most recently on the two near peer problem, which he'll be speaking to us about today. His lecture today is entitled Tripolar Instability, Nuclear Competition Among the United States, Russia, and China. Per usual with our CGSR lectures, Dr. Litwack will speak for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll turn to the audience for Q&A. Feel free to start raising your hands electronically or typing your questions into the chat before the Q&A session starts. Uh, with that said, Dr. Litwack, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to CGSR. I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Well, thank you, Asmerit, and it is a pleasure to be back at uh, CGSR. Um, I benefited from uh, the center's recent publication, China's Emergence uh, as a Second uh, Nuclear Peer, the study group that, that the center sponsored. It's an excellent study that I would commend uh, to all. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I know the, uh, the director, Brad Roberts, is on travel. Um, he's a leading thought leader uh, in this field of nuclear issues, and I have benefited from his insights on nuclear issues over the years and uh, was uh, delighted to receive the invitation from him to uh, speak to the group. It's my second time doing so, uh, so it's a pleasure to, to, to uh, uh, engage uh, your community uh, virtually. Um, last time I was there in person. Um, my remarks today are derived from my new publication uh, by the same title as today's talk, and uh, as Merritt and, and Katie will distribute uh, um, to this group uh, uh, the PDF or link to, to access it. The Economist magazine in late 2022 declared, and then there were three. This statement was made in response to the expansion of Chinese strategic nuclear forces with the goal of achieving parity with the United States and Russia. The nuclear posture review uh, projected by the 2030s, the United States will face two nuclear peer competitors. Uh, by that time, um, uh, based on current projections, China will be a full nuclear peer competitor with the United States. Uh, in so doing, China is ending its long-standing minimum deterrent posture. Um, China's ICBM uh, force, in, according to open literature, uh, is estimated to rise from about 100 in 2020 uh, to the low hundreds currently and is on a pace uh, to reach uh, 1,000 uh, by the end of the, this decade. Nuclear bipolarity of the Cold War and post-Cold War eras is being supplanted by emergent nuclear tripolarity. In China and Russia, the United States now faces two peer nuclear powers which have established a quasi-alliance. China has shed its longstanding minimal deterrent nuclear posture and is on this trajectory to attain parity with the United States. The impressive scope, scale, and pace of China's nuclear modernization program creates a strategic inflection point for U.S. national security officials. International relations theorists have long debated whether a bipolar or multipolar great power system is more stable. Whereas in astrophysics, a stable two-body celestial system becomes chaotically unstable with the addition of a third body. For the United States, the two-peer challenge is emerging against the backdrop of Russia's war in Ukraine, which the Director of National Intelligence called a tectonic geostrategic shift and a simmering crisis with China over Taiwan. The Ukraine war has been waged under a nuclear shadow. Uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov declared that NATO is waging a proxy war against Russia, and the risk of nuclear war is considerable. The director 
of Central Intelligence, uh, William Burns, uh, declared that given Russian military setbacks currently being put to the test in, in with a counteroffensive by Ukraine, the, the, as he put it, potential desperation of Putin could create a potential resort to low-yield nuclear weapons. Uh, during the Ukraine war, particularly a year ago, last summer, um, U.S.-China tensions escalated over Taiwan. President Biden, on four occasions, I believe, uh, declared a U.S. commitment to defend Taiwan in response to large-scale uh, Chinese air and naval exercises and incursions near the island. This was this declaratory policy was a shift from the long-standing policy of strategic ambiguity uh, about Taiwan, uh, maintaining uh, uncertainty about what the United States would respond pres when President Biden made those statements. Um, they were walked back subsequently by some White House officials. But this this suggests that uh, the, the U.S. commitment to Taiwan um, is uh, uh, has been declared by the president uh, to be a, a vital interest. In this new era, uh, this rising of the two-peer problem, great power competition is recasting two Cold War risks that date back to the 1950s. The first risk is what analysts called the instability stability paradox. That is, that stability at the nuclear level could generate instability and make non-nuclear limited wars possible along the periphery uh, in regions that we then called in the, during the Cold War, the third world. Think Vietnam, Afghanistan, Angola, Nicaragua. The stakes of these Cold War conflicts were less than vital. By contrast, the potential flashpoints today uh, are a vital, not peripheral interest. Taiwan for China, Ukraine for Russia. This first risk, the recasting of the, of the stability and stability paradox, is compounded, compounded by the second risk that's being recast. The assumption of a stable nuclear deterrent was questioned by the Rand Corporation's Albert Wallstetter in his seminal foreign affairs article of 1958, The Delicate Balance of Terror. His concern then was the vulnerability of US bombers to his disarming Soviet first strike. The crux of Wallstetter's argument was that a situation in which one side or the other saw an advantage in going first, acting preemptively in a crisis, was highly unstable. That dynamic was evident during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Small numbers of systems on both sides, um, relatively invulnerable compared to today. In its aftermath, the deployment of second strike systems by both sides created a system of mutual deterrence based on assured retaliation. The United States, that required an uneasy you know, psychological adjustment. The United States was not used to being vulnerable. So dealing with the reality of, of vulnerability in the nuclear age required this psychological readjustment uh, that was a difficult one to navigate. That the, the onset of secure second strike systems, removing the incentive for either side to go first or early in a crisis, created the predicate for superpower arms control that was realized during the detente era. Uh, when, in the, when the first groundbreaking agreements, SALT, ABM, uh, were, were negotiated, it was the beginning of a rules-bound bipolar nuclear order. And stability rested, uh, the foundation was uh, assured retaliation, mutual assured retaliation. Now we face an eroded bipolar nuclear order and an emergent tripolar system without guardrails. In the new era, as Henry Kissinger put it, deterrent relationships are becoming more, to use Wallstetter's term, more delicate. And the incentive to go first in a crisis is increasing. The interaction of these recast Cold War risks, the two risks, the stability and stability paradox and the delicate balance of terror, create escalatory risks 
and undermine strategic stability. Strategic stability has been traditionally defined to encompass two components, arms race stability and crisis stability. The dilemma today is that arms race instability could lead to crisis instability in instances in which the stakes are vital. So in contrast to the Cold War where the, the, it was posited that a stable central strategic relationship would deflect conflict to peripheral areas. Now the competition is not over the periphery, it's over vital interests, Ukraine, Taiwan. And in, in tandem with that, the central strategic balance is becoming uh, more delicate. Uh, and the elements of uh, the sources of that stability uh, um, arise, the, the, the instability arises from a, from a range of developments begin with the dismantling of the arms control architecture, ABM, INF, the others. New START remains in force until 2026. Putin has suspended, but not withdrawn from the treaty, uh, which constrains both sides to two, 1,550 deployed strategic, strategic nuclear warheads. At the same time, Russia, China, and the United States are all modernizing their nuclear forces. They are engaged essentially in unmanaged competition. China, as noted, has shifted from its minimum deterrence posture under and under Xi Jinping's modernization program is on this trajectory to achieve parity by the mid 2030s. Conventional and nuclear balances are changing simultaneously. In East Asia, US conventional superiority is eroding um, and that the the dilemma for the United States, that is in both East Asia and in Europe, uh, US allies are close to revisionist powers. Russia seeking kind of has revisionist revanchist aims in Europe. China seeks to change the territorial status quo, not only in Taiwan, but in its assertive uh, maritime claims, uh, its expansive definition of sovereignty and its exclusive economic zone. In addition, um, the distinction between nuclear and conventional is blurring with new systems such as hypersonics and Russia's development of uh, low yield nuclear weapons, which the Kremlin might view or asserts uh, might be more usable in a conventional conflict. And that is the nuclear shadow that has been hanging over the Ukraine war. China was long considered a lesser included threat. The notion was that if you can deal with the Soviet Union, you can handle the small minimum deterrent force of, 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 of China. The question now is, what does China's, the advent of China as a pure nuclear power, what does it mean for US force planning? Do we need a, a different or larger force? Of course, China's emergence as a near peer nuclear competitor marks a shift uh, from a bipolar to tripolar nuclear order. But that systemic shift has not prompted a fundamental change in planning uh, for the US nuclear force structure. The Biden administration has stated that the issue is not, as, the, as, as an official put it, arithmetic, that US nuclear forces need to equal those of Russia and China combined. Rather, according to a senior Biden administration Defense Department official, U.S. nuclear strategy under the conditions of tripolarity will be will focus on maintaining a survivable second strike cap capability such that in any contingency with Russia and China, the United States would retain enough in reserve to hold at risk so much that other that other nuclear powers so hold in risk so much that other nuclear powers hold is valuable that they wouldn't dare challenge the United States. That was a quote derived from a, a, a policy statement from, from a senior a DOD official. Essentially, it's arguing that the current force, um, uh, two thirds of which roughly is uh, based uh, uh, at, at sea, provides um, the capability for a survivable second strike that could hold at risk what China and Russia hold valuable and that that force um, should be adequate in the new environment. That view has been taken to task by critics who argue 
that the United States will need a larger force uh, as a hedge. This is a current debating point, uh, a key issue in the, in, the, in the nuclear debate in this country. A follow-on question to the two-peer new adversary question, challenge is whether the United States could address simultaneous crises in two theaters. And there is the challenge of cross-domain deterrence as competition extends into the new realms, newish realms of, of cyber and outer space. In addition, there are technological dis dislocations relating to, relating to accuracy and reconnaissance that could undermine deterrence through vulnerability. Uh, these, these elements, which I've just characterized, uh, are promoters of arms race stability. Arms race instability, which is one of the two components of strategic stability, will invariably increase crisis instability, which is the other aspect of, of, of strategic stability. The Cold War model of a crisis escalation, conventional to nuclear, no longer holds. The initiation of great power conflict would likely come in the domains of cyber and outer space, where it could be misleadingly viewed as less escalatory without the loss because of the, the without the loss of life. China might seek to, or Russia might seek to introduce malware or um, uh, um, in a non-kinetic way or, or kinetic attack, a satellite, um, which is critical for command and control. Um, China and Russia may not view that as escalatory, but it would be you know, inherently so. Um, we should approach this with a um, fair de degree of, 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 of modesty because we have no experience in controlling escalation and an unfounded confidence uh, that we can control it. In a crisis, one side will take preparations to demonstrate resolve, which the other side could view as a prelude to use. That's the classic you know, deterrence dilemma. Um, but the new element is that the stakes of the current flashpoints are vital to the parties, and therefore it makes it difficult to assess uh, political will, what uh, uh, the uh, strategist uh, Thomas Schelling called the competition in risk-taking, that in a crisis where it's over vital stakes, where arms race stability is, is evident, China, for example, might take an escalatory move like a blockade of Taiwan or seize an island. Uh, Russia may try to um, take an escalatory move crossing a, you know, into uh, attacking um, uh, NATO you know, supply uh, nodes um, uh, in NATO countries um, in for, for um, munitions intended for Ukraine. Escalatory moves like that, where Russia and China may feel that they could win in a competition in risk taking with the United States. Um, so it's in the escalatory dynamics are, are uh, and risks are, are significant. That what one what one has now is that, that the occasion of nuclear par the emergent nuclear parity with China is occurring at a time um, when uh, um, the guardrails of arms control are being lifted. Competition is shifting into new areas, cyber, outer space, with new technologies uh, on, on, in the wings, hypersonics, artificial intelligence. And thirdly, there are ongoing, there's an ongoing war in Ukraine and a crisis over, over Taiwan. So this, this mix, um, this confluence of factors, uh, raises significant um, escalatory risks. And it's at a time, and this relates to the atrophying of, of uh, arms control, where our tools and structures to manage competition, um, the guardrails uh, are no longer there. And to the extent that they remain, they may be insufficient uh, to meet current challenges. So here we are. Um, the Biden administration has proposed strategic stability talks with China, but Beijing has shown no interest, evidently believing that the U.S. goal is to lock in Chinese inferiority. With Russia, um, unlike China, we have a history and perhaps some shared understandings about key concepts like deterrence, but such a dialogue with Russia is not possible amidst the Ukraine war. 
Um, that said, there may be practical steps to reduce the risks of inadvertent escalation. Um, so let me turn finally to, to um, uh, practical measures that are realistic um, to promote uh, strategic stability. Key elements, some aspirational, others operational, most uncertain will affect the prospects for successful management um, in the emergent tripolar nuclear, nuclear order. Um, even if the pathways for implementing these measures are not uh, evident politically, we may not see a pathway now to get there. We can analytically uh, distinguish major policies that would promote strategic stability. So that's kind of the role here. I'm not here with a political prescription of how to get from here to there. I'm trying to identify within the current context analytically what, what elements would promote strategic stability. And let me run through six elements. First, starting point, reinforce comprehensive deterrence. Managing instability in a tripolar world requires the United States to remain main, to maintain a robust strategy of deterrence in both its variants. You will recall there is deterrence by denial and deterrence by punishment. Deterrence by punishment seeks to affect the intention of the state to carry out a hostile act through the credible uh, threat of a, of a punitive response. So that after Russia's invasion of you know, Ukraine, the United States bolstered this variant of deterrence by reaffirming its collective security commitment through NATO and threatening, quote unquote, severe consequences if Russia used nuclear uh, weapons of any magnitude. Uh, as National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan put it, the United States would not, quote unquote, slice the salami um, if on the magnitude of nuclear use. Any nuclear use would be crossing that Rubicon. Alternatively, there, the other variant, deterrence by denial, would entail defensive measures that frustrate an, abil an adversary's ability to achieve its, uh, its objective. In the new domains of cyber and space warfare, deterrence by denial strategies would entail hardening cyber and space assets to deny an adversary the benefits an of an attack and thereby decrease the incentive for preemptive action in a crisis. Another element is maintaining credible conventional military forces in key theaters. That's a form of deterrence by denial. If the United States maintains some a, a semblance of a nuclear of a conventional balance in Northeast Asia, it'll make it'll present a less attractive target for China to try to change the, the territorial status quo as it's entering a period of nuclear parity with the United States. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, NATO countries have increased military spending and uh, for deployed forces that are both more capable and visible. And in East Asia, we face a, 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 an analogous challenge with China over Taiwan. The bottom line on deterrence is that a comprehensive deterrence policy, one that integrates both variants, deterrence by denial, deterrence by punishment, can affect Russia's and China's strategic calculus. The goal is to uh, have them abstain from Shelling's competition and risk-taking. That's the first element. The second element is maintain the residual arms control architecture. Though Putin has suspended New START, Russia has stated it will continue to abide by its numerical constraint of 1,550 warheads uh, on 700 delivery vehicles. New START will expire in 2026 and will not be extended extended beyond that date. With China's emergence as a pure nuclear competitor, the United States has made clear that Chinese capabilities must be taken into account. The emerging con conventional wisdom, though, is that, quote unquote, arms control is dead. You hear that quite a lot. Uh, but it should be qualified. Um, look at history. States will participate in arms control negotiations when their leaderships believe it serves their interest. Superpower arms control created a framework that structured U.S. and Soviet force posture development, providing provided transparency and predictability. As China modernizes and expands its nuclear forces, Beijing may see that participating in trilateral arms control serves its interests by preserving the new start uh, ceiling 
on strategic nuclear systems and thereby locking in emergent nuclear uh, emergent its its emergent parity status. China may feel that an agreement that locks Russia and China, Russia and the United States into 1550 may serve their interest and would be a cap that they could they they could live with and would serve their interests. Um, th this incentive um, um, could lead Beijing to engage with the United States on strategic arms limitations, um, as well as on theater missile forces um, to forestall, forestall a regional arms race. Um, in addition, as China moves toward near peer nuclear status with the United States, Beijing's increased confidence that China has attained an assured retaliatory capability may create the basis for its participation in trilateral uh, arms control talks. China had a longstanding minimum deterrent posture. It's built up, it's building up to parity. Um, we can, it's an opaque system. One can surmise the reasons for it. It may be that Xi Jinping feels that nuclear parity is is an accoutrement to great power status and is building up for that reason. It may be because uh, it may have arisen out of China's concern that a small number of systems, um, land-based primarily, uh, created a, a vulnerability for China uh, and opened the door to a, a, uh, a potential US first strike in, in some crisis scenario if they had a small number of, of, of systems. Um, the third element that I would, I would highlight is mitigate the risks of unconstrained competition. In the absence of arms control architecture of an arms control architecture, each nuclear power in the multipolar system will have strategic autonomy to structure its offensive and defensive systems. Since the Cuban Missile Crisis, assured retaliation, which is that is, is eliminating incentives for surprise uh, first attack, has been the foundation of strategic stability. The risk for crisis stability is that arms race instability, that is unregulated number of offensive and defensive systems in tandem with new weapons technologies and cross domain threats to cyber and uh, uh, space assets could revive those incentives. And in so doing, make the deterrent relationships more delicate. That's the central theme of my new study. In the past, arms control negotiations provided a um, forum for strategic discourse. In their absence, less structured government-to-government -government contacts and unofficial track to expert con contacts could yield understandings and norms short of formal agreements, uh, agreements about uh, force structures and doctrines that could bolster stability. Think, for example, about the removal of tactical nuclear weapons from the Korean Peninsula in 1991 by Gorbachev and George H.W. Bush. Um, in that instance, progress was made through reciprocal independent actions that were based on mutual interests. In the current environment, the United States has proposed a moratorium uh, on tests of destructive direct ascent uh, anti-satellite um, ASAT explosives that could be used preemptively against military satellites in a crisis. Um, ASAT tests, of course, are also the source of destructive space debris in low Earth orbit that threaten manned space missions and satellites. Without a formal agreement, the United States, Russia, and China might each unilaterally observe a tacit norm proscribing ASAT tests. Um, third, rather, excuse me, fourth, um, I touched on reinforce comprehensive deterrence, maintain the residual arms control architecture, third, mitigate the risk of unconstrained competition, fourth, avoid blurring conventional military and nuclear operations to prevent inadvertent escalation. Placing conventional warheads on ballistic or hypersonic missiles, um, there was the proposal for conventional global strike, for example, that has a utility, um, the ability to reach any target on the globe in, in one hour, but runs the risk that one side or the other may perceive and respond uh, to the launch of a missile uh, that it associates with the other side's nuclear capabilities and, and view that as the initiation of, of, of an attack. Um, such concern has been raised with respect 
to dual use hypersonic weapons developed by Russia and China that could carry either nuclear or conventional warheads. It won't be clear if a hypersonic's coming in, um, what's the warhead? And is it, where does, where, what would be the escalatory potential of that? Uh, an additional driver of inadvertent escalation is the targeting of an adversary's conventional capabilities that are co-located with its nuclear capabilities. Uh, concern that the use of conventional military weapons could escalate a conflict by placing nuclear assets at risk has been raised most acutely with respect to the strategic competition between the United States and China. Fifth, maintain open diplomatic and, and uh, military communications lines. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin um, citing the importance of maintaining lines of communications with amid the ongoing war has spoken uh, to his Russian counterpart, Sergei Shoigu, uh, several times. Director of Central Intelligence Burns has likewise maintained an open channel of communication with his counterpart um, in overseas meetings to communicate messages to Putin from Biden, including a warning uh, against any use by Russia of, of a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. In addition, uh, NATO and Russia have a deconfliction line uh, which, as with other channels, can avoid um, a miscommunication and inadvertent escalation. I think the model there was what was set up in Syria between to deconflict uh, the U.S. and, and Russian uh, air assets. Um, China and the United States have a code for plan unplanned encounters at seas. The acronym is QS. Both are signatory. Uh, that's a mechanism for managing maritime tensions between their navies. Obviously, given ongoing incidents. Uh, that mechanism is not being availed of, um, and, uh, but is a potential area where the two sides could cooperate to avoid an inadvertent escalation. And sixth and finally is the challenge of managing complex linkages in a tripolar system. Um, in this triadic relationship, actions taken to address one adversary can affect the other. So the United States withdrew from the INF Treaty uh, it was occasioned by Russian treaty, cheating uh, with the deployment of a new cruise missile, um, but was uh, probably precipitated uh, or a, contri a, 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 a contributing precipitant uh, was the advent of, of a new generation of theater missile threats in East Asia posed by China. Uh, these complex linkages were also evident in China's response to uh, the U.S. deployment of, of the THAAD anti missile system in South Korea, which was motivated by North Korean ballistic missile advances, but Beijing has is, is, um, asserted, whether it's justified or not, um, that that move, the deployment of THAAD, uh, could be the precursor to a more elaborate defensive capability aimed at neutralizing uh, China's um, you know, nuclear deterrent. A similar um, concern was raised about the United States' thin anti-ballistic missile deployments in, in, in Alaska, uh, which were focused on North Korea's um, uh, rising ballistic missile threat to the U.S. homeland. So those six factors are elements, aspirational, potentially operational, most uncertain, that could help manage strategic stability or strategic instability in the current environment. So let me conclude that we are indeed at a strategic inflection point. And when Einstein was asked, how to unravel, how we could unravel the structure of the atom, but was unable to devise political means to prevent it from destroying humanity. He famously replied, because as he put it, politics is more difficult than physics. Current nuclear risks are even more complex and dangerous because of the multiplicity of actors, emergent technologies, and the absence of, inst of an institutional framework to manage competition. The policy tensions created by the recasting of the Cold War risks that I highlighted at the beginning, the st st stability and stability paradox and the delicate balance of terror. Those recast risks will affect the prospects for strategic stability and the avoidance of a crisis instability in Europe related to the Ukraine war and in Asia over Taiwan. In the new tripolar uh, nuclear world, these policy tensions cannot be resolved but they can be managed. They cannot even be managed, however, absent a threshold recognition 
among the three powers of their mutual interest in halting the destabilizing spiral into unconstrained competition. With that, uh, back to Azmara. Thank you.